Hi, this is Hobson Lane, your professor in CISC 179 again. It's the, let's see, 14th week of um, CISC 179. And you've got two more weeks, two and a half weeks to finish your final project. So I thought I'd give you some tips. I'm going to run through a lot of information really quickly for those of you who don't have a whole lot of time. So feel free to pause the video at any part that doesn't make any sense. Uh, until you can follow along on your computer. First thing, of course, is to get up an, an IDE. Hopefully, many of you have figured this out on your own. But um, I like the SPIDER um, IDE for any kind of work uh, in a class like this, where you don't know what kind of operating system your users might have, so or, or students in this case. And so, because Spider is written in Python, and so you could even uh, potentially contribute to it as an open source project. It and it it only and because it's a Python package, you only need to say pip install Spider, and that will work on any machine. Um, that's pretty awesome because that will then install a shell like similar to the Bash shell within the IPython console. So once you've done pip install spider, it'll go through many, many dependencies. In order to set all that up, it has to install a lot of other Python packages that emulate uh, a real operating system like Linux on a Windows machine or a Macintosh or wherever you are. That way you can be sure that you're using standard POSIX commands, P-O-S-I-X, which is a way of um, uh, it's an open standard for uh, commands that you should be familiar with because the world runs on Linux and these commands will work on any machine. Um, so the next thing is you want to launch Spider. I launched it in the foreground, which was is a blocking task. So in Linux, you can control Z to push it to the background um, and or actually pause the program and then um, BG to push it to the background. So anyway, so now it's running in the background and you can see it here. Um, uh, and next thing I wanna do, um, uh, while we're on the topic of IDEs, another one, another great IDE that I, that's used by a lot of professionals is called the, um, the Sublime Text Editor. Uh, this is built by an Australian team. Uh, it was originally launched by an individual developer who just built it for themselves. Um, it's, uh, it is, written in Python, but it is closed source and um, and the, but it is free. It will just nag you about the paid license about every 10 times you set a file. And I'd like to save it in Sublime just to see what happens when you, with some automatic tools that are built into Sublime. Uh, there's an, a package that will automatically reformat it. So you can see that the student had some extra spaces. I'll do control Z just so you can see what that was. There were some blank spaces, eight spaces on this line, and you can see them highlighted. This is called linting when your IDE highlights problems with your potential problems with your code. Um, and um, so it looks like um, it's the main thing it doesn't like about these lines of code is that there's only one space before the line above. So functions need to have two spaces just so they're more uh, differentiated from the rest of your code. Also, this one, not only does it have only a single space, but it has a lot of empty, unused characters in that line. So uh, you hit Control S to save, and this will work in most editors. Control S will save your file to the existing file name. And that cleans up the code a lot better, makes it a lot more easier to read. Um, and this is called PEP8, which is the style that requires, for instance, two lines between functions and global variable declarations um, uh, to separate them out from functions. Um, and, um, and other little things like spaces around mathematical operators, like your, or the Boolean operator, the double equals for checking conditions. You can see we have spaces around those. Fortunately, the student did really well on, um, on spacing out their their code anyway. So anyway, that took care of a little bit of stuff. And so now we want to open that same project over here in Spider. I'm going to go to projects. I'm going to say open project. And let's pause. Actually, we want to create a 
new project rather than opening an existing one. So let's open a new project, but it's in a, an existing directory. Um, uh, we'll call it, uh, we'll, let's go ahead and get the folder open. It'll probably name it for the folder once we have it open. So let's go to, I have a code directory in my home directory. So you can see here inside of home, Hobbs, I've got code. And inside of there, I've got the projects that I work with on GitLab. So I've got Hobbs, which is my personal account, and then Mesa Python and Tangible AI are different organizations that I have set up in GitLab. And then inside of there, where you'll find the CISC 179. Over on GitLab, this, this is the exact same uh, folder structure that you'll see there. So just to remind you, uh, when you're going to GitLab, you're going to um, you're going to go to gitlab.com. I highly recommend typing things like short URLs into the command line yourself so you can be sure you go to the right place. Um, also, it will prevent uh, search engines from advertising things to you. Uh, then you can go to whatever your sub. So in this case, it's going to be Mesa Python, just like the name of the course on RuneStone. And then you're going to want to type um, CISC 179, Spring 2024. You could go directly to Mesa Python, and it will should list uh, that um, that repository for you right before here. So you can CISC, just click on that link. So that's how you get to the actual repository itself. I've already cloned and downloaded that to my local machine. So we need to just open that folder here in Spider, and it's going to create it inside of that pro in that um, folder. And it's going to give it the same name for that project as the folder name. Awesome. So you can see that now the because I've opened it or created a project. Um, on an existing folder, that entire folder with that folder structure is here. And within this, the same folder structure that's on GitLab, yeah, you can find your midterm projects submitted here, and you can find your data-driven projects, which one student has already submitted here. And I'm going to then open that file from the student, and you can see that it's been cleaned up a little bit since we edited it with Sublime to remove some white space and add some white space for those new lines to, to, um, to have it comply with PEP8. Um, next, um, so uh, another, the next thing I want you to work on is, um, so we'd like to, I'm in that same folder here over on a, um, on a console. You can see, actually let's use the spider console. That's one of the great things about spider. Let's, uh, let's make this a little smaller. In fact, uh, I guess I was hoping we could just collapse this uh, side drawer, but it's okay. Uh, you can expand out the, the console here on the lower right, and we can type any commands we want, including shell commands. We can type ls to figure out where we are. We can figure out, uh, so we can cd into src. So these are bash shell commands or POSIX commands. Uh, POSIX is a standard for Linux. Um, then we can CD into, um, less, we can CD into CS179. I apologize for the name of the, and the course number there. It should be CISC179. Um, but I don't want to change anything with all of the links that I've sent out to people. Okay. We've got, uh, the adventures. We can see the data driven. We can CD into data driven and we can run those applications. Uh, the way you can run them, um, in I, this is called an IPython console that blends some magic commands like this ls, cd, and uh, with, these are bash commands that it's able to do um, within a Python script. You can do think normal things like Python, like hello world. You can do your print statements and everything just like you would normally with Python, but you can also do bash commands or... Uh, born again shell or um, POSIX shell, whatever you'd like to call it, um, within that, at least some of the most important commands. Uh, next, so to run, there's a, magic commands are normally preceded by a percent sign, and there's one of them called run, 
Um, there's another one called time it. We're not going to talk about that, but I just wanted to mention that there's a lot of them. You can hit tab character to get more help on any command in IPython, whether it's Python or magic. So I type percent first, so it would list all the magic commands. And I want to go down to the one that is going to allow me to run a program. I bet you can guess what that command is called. It's instead of launching Python by typing Python, you just type percent run because we're already in Python. And uh, CD, okay, I can't, I've forgotten my alphabet. Uh, P run, I don't know what that is, but this is a great way to learn new commands by uh, by investigating the help or tab completion. Um, this is something you can do on an airplane. So um, uh, one of my heroes in the Python and AI world, Peter Norvig, he... Um, we don't want to remove anything. There it is. Uh, you could, of course, just type percent run, and that will work the same. Let's make this bigger. Yeah, so we need to make this a lot bigger so you can see what I'm typing. Control Shift Plus will make the font bigger if you're ever giving your own presentations. If any of you would like to give your presentation at the Python user group on the last Thursday or the fourth Thursday of every month, um, would love to help you prepare for that. Uh, anyway, percent run, and then we give it the name of the program. Again, I'm just going to type K and hit tab, and it completed the rest of the command for me. Um, so we're all set there, and I can run her game. And now we've got her game. Notice how we've got a sleep command between printing out statements, and she's got a lot of handy instructions on how to enter commands. And she accepts capital letters and lowercase letters or whole words even. Um, you can even do, do all caps if you like, and it will still work just as you plan. I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out control C to stop any running program or, and this works in any uh, Linux compatible terminal. It should also work on your Windows machine. Um, Next, so we've we've run the program. Now we wanna clean it up a little bit. I'm gonna show you how to, another handy command that you can do in the terminal is you need to install these packages that we're gonna be using here. So there's three new formats that I'd like you to learn how to use for your data-driven um, application. Uh, this student has used uh, the text file format, which is just um, one line uh, per, uh, she, they read it uh, line by line and then parsed it looking for these colon characters. This is a custom format. Um, so dot text just means any human readable text and um, or ASCII text typically. Um, but um, there's a lot more. You can give some structure to this. that makes it a lot easier to read if you use something like CSV. So there, in order to work with CSV files, I like to use this package called Pandas. Um, this is probably the most common format that you'll ever use for data. Uh, so we're going to work with that first. Uh, pip install pandas. Um, looks like it's already been installed, so we're good to go. And I would like, while we're here, I'm going to go ahead and, well, let's, let's go ahead and work with pandas first. So next thing you want to do is you want to import pandas. Um, I like to give it the abbreviation, and this is very, very common on the web. Uh, you want to you want to abbreviate the package name with PD. That's the same command as if you wrote import pandas, just like you would normally for like import random or uh, any of the other packages you might, or import time is another package that um, that the student used in their, in their project. But um, this is the same, import pandas as PD is the same as import pandas and then creating a new variable and assigning it to that package's name uh, or module's name. So now we can use PD. You don't need to type these other two commands. This does that already. So it's just a shorthand for, for these commands. Uh, okay, next move on. Uh, let's try uh, pd.read CSV. And I can give it this text file of this student and, and it should read it in that's not the, the key feature of it. It may or may not work. Um, uh, okay. It looks like, um, oh, the commas are giving it trouble. So we need to tell it um, what the separator is. And looks like 
they have used a colon on every single line. So I'm hopeful if they only use one colon, we can use a separator as colon rather than comma. And now we've, now we've got the entire file read in in a table. It has 32 lines. You can see that, um, or 32 row, rows in that table. Um, it looks like it, it looks like the text file has 34 lines of text. As you know, Python's uh, zero offset. Um, but something's a little fishy. Oh, no, I don't see any word wrapping going on. Anyway, it's a mystery, but uh, we've got the data in. Um, a better way to run that command, now you can hit up arrow to repeat a command, and of course, left arrow to move your cursor around inside. And I like to call them a data frame, DF, as an abbreviation for data frame. This is a word that's used in pandas to describe tables that you can manipulate with Python commands. So you can see what the columns, oh, that's right. That's why we lost a row because it. I thought the first row was a column. So these are things that you probably aren't gonna need to do with your own um, CSV file but they can be handy if you've got a, an existing file that's not formatted in the typical CSV format. So I'm gonna say header equals none or false. I'm not sure which, and because it thought that the column names, oh, I'll go, to, go ahead and show you the bug, uh, df.columns. You can see that it thinks that the column names are wake up, but that's actually a word in the, in the actual file of the data. So we wanna separate, um, of course, uh, names of, of variables and things and columns from the actual data itself. And that's usually put in the header row of a CSV. You'll be familiar with this if you've ever worked with it. a spreadsheet program that saves your files as CSV. Okay, so let's, uh, let's give it another command, header equals false and see if that does the trick. Uh, nope, header equals none. There we go. And now let's see how many rows this guy has. 33, just like we want. Bec oh, not 33 rows, 34 rows, but the last index is 30, 34. So we can say 33. <laughs> so you can say uh, DF, let's see what happens when we do DF square bracket 33. Okay. This is used in Python, I'm sorry, in pandas to refer to the column rather than the row. If you want the row, you need to say iloc or loc. Uh, I think we can say loc on this and that will work. And we can also say iloc. Iloc because um, it's the integer location or the index location. Uh, loc means the, um, you can also give these things names. Anyway, um, you don't need to know all of this about pandas, but you can you can look at their documentation for how to work with um, individual rows. So I'll show you more about that within the program itself. Um, so this is how we could load uh, data into CSV file more, but that's not so fancy because we've just used an existing file. What's really handy is when you um, give it some structure, uh, like if you had some dictionaries here that you wanted to store. Um, so, um, but for now I'm going, well, I'm just gonna save it in a proper CSV format. So you, the way you do that in pandas is we're gonna say tfdf is the object instance of this table called a data frame um, to CSV, obviously why. Um, we need to tell it whether it should have, um, uh, we, first we need to give it the file name that we want to start, save it to. So we're going to save it to that exact same name again. Uh, but this time give it the extension CSV rather than TXT. Um, that's probably enough, except that I might want to avoid saving the index. So the index is that zero, one, two, three for each row. I could also avoid saving the header, which is also 0123 at the moment. Um, but um, actually that gives me an idea. Before we do this, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna instead go back to our, I'm gonna give our, so df.columns now doesn't contain data. It contains just zero and one because it doesn't know what the column names are. But I'm gonna give it some good names. Uh, here's another command in Python you're going to like. Um, we're going to call this. So this is the function name. It looks like uh, 
function name I'm going to give it uh, as a key. You don't have to put underscores. These are just strings. You can call them whatever you want. But I'm going to use a, a space separated list. Um, uh, and I'm going to split it with Python to make things easy on me. Because okay, well, I'll show you the, the raw way, the correct way to do it um, normally. You just give it a list and you can create a, a, a list instance with a uh, function name and then uh, text for the actual messages that, uh, that are in that room. Uh, that should do it. Um, and so now when we say df.columns, uh, it's displaying a lot more, but you can see that the function name is right above the column for uh, the function name and the text. It's fortunately, it's, it's trying to display in 80 columns. Ah, oh, here we go. Let's make it full size. No. Uh, how can I make it full size? Well, I'm going to undock it and make it bigger. Uh, this way you can see the the beautiful formatting that pandas gives you when you're working with data. It's a lot handier format, you make it larger. But now we've got the column name. So we can say, if we're looking for a key, we say df square bracket function name, or if we're looking for a function name. This will give us a list of all the function names. If we're looking for the text. We can give it a list of text. And if we're looking for, we can also, we can make that function name the index by saying df dot set index. And I need to tell it um, which column. Uh, so this will be the function name. I think this will work. Awesome. It, it did that and returned a copy of the data frame. So if I go back to data frame, it's going to be back to the old format. So I'm going to bring it, I'm going to, I need, if I'm going to set the index to a new a column, uh, I'm going to have to reassign it back to the old variable name to change it. There we go. So now we've got a, a, an easier one to look up. So now we can do DF. I want to look up, for instance, wake up. I think it's going to say that this is ambiguous because it, there is no column named wake up, but there is a row named wake up. So we're going to, what we need to do is we're going to say dot loc for saying location. And we need to say, um, if we want to say, if there are multiple columns that we need to call that out with which column we wanted. So we could say, we could go to the row and column by doing it this way. Uh, you could also look, you can look up the text just like we did before. You can look up the, the text column all by itself. Um, you notice that uh, pandas uh, columns come attached to the index. Uh, that makes them easier to keep track of what's in what's where. And so with that, you could then do, if you just did things in the opposite order of maybe what your instinct is, you could get that wake up message by looking for text uh, for wake up. So that's kind of a handy little syntax. It's kind of like a, a dictionary of dictionaries. Um, and that's how um, Pandas has implemented indexing for your data frame table. Really, really handy if you have many columns uh, per row. It's probably not the best data structure for the data-driven application because it doesn't give you a lot of flexibility. It's just a one-to-one -one mapping that you've got. Um, if you did want to store something like a nested list of dictionaries, like the the pattern that I think would make a lot of sense for a text adventure or a video game or anything where you need to manage state is one where you have a nested uh, list of dictionaries. So um, create a flat dictionary by saying df.toDict, I think it is. And so this gives us just a key value pair for those um, those function names and the um, and um, let's uh, let's that, now that I say that I want to the function names um, and then colon the uh, mapped to or matched with the uh, the text that goes in that room. Let's see how this student has utilized that data. Oh, I'll keep going to my favorite editor, uh, Sublime. Let's get rid of that. 
Let's go to, back to Spider, if I can find it. I've got two windows there. There we go. And let's look at the actual code and see how she's using the data within the Python program. Uh, looks like we got tabs up here. Let's get rid of the temp file and let's make it bigger again. It looks like it detached it, but it didn't go away. Uh, interesting. Uh, I guess I'll just close it. Hope I can open it back up again when I need it. And looks like it gives you some, some instructions on a tutorial, but I'm just gonna wipe it to the side as best I can. Okay, next, let's um, let's see how the function names are being used. So she has, she's enumerating the file using another really cool um, Python built-in function called enumerate. Uh, that will automatically associate an index with each line in a file. And then she got the, uh, she split her text on the, colon character. That's the command I was going to show you to split the column names on spaces. But if you give it a, a, an argument, um, it will split on that character. So just like we use that as a separator to read it like it was a CSV, like it basically just substitutes the colon for a comma and, um, and then reads it in like it does normally. Um, and she's also stripping off any white space with that strip command. Looks great. Uh, she's got all descriptions, and let's see how she's using all descriptions later on. Okay, so she has she has to remember the function name and which function it goes with. Um, the way that I would have done this would be put the actual function name exactly as it's spelled in your code here. Um, let's find one where she's done that either accidentally or on purpose. Ooh, looks like she's got a lot more logic inside of individual functions. Uh, this is a bit tricky when you have to remember all of these names in order to get your, your logic to work. I'm really impressed that they were able to get it all to work reliably using um, this, uh, this approach. Um, this is called um, repeating yourself when she's, they have repeated the, the names of these keys in two places, and they're very far apart. And uh, also there's several different if statements that are far apart. So the ideal way to build a uh, data-driven app is with a while loop, and then utilizing these keys. I'll give you one last tip on uh, for, your, um, for your Python final project. Um, this video is already quite long. So let's um, give you one last tip. Um, you can, instead, if you ever do want to call a function, all of your functions will exist. Let's bring up that console. I like to do everything in an inter interactive console. So you can, there's this variable called global. So it's not a variable, it's actually a function. It will read in the stack. Uh, if you're familiar with computer science, you'll know what the stack is. But the stack contains all of your variables and all of your functions as well. So you can look up any particular key. Um, also, IPython has this who command, so you can see what your stack contains in terms of variables. Uh, globals will contain even more variables than this, like some hidden variables that begin with underscore. Won't go into all of that, but there's a lot of hidden magic in Python that you can learn about over time. Uh, for now, you just should know that if you want to call a function, you can call the globals function first, and then you, it returns a dictionary. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and put that dictionary in a variable called G. Um, so you can see all of that data is there, and you can see that it ends in a curly square bracket. So this is a dictionary, and so you can look up any variable you'd like, uh, in that dictionary. So let's pick a variable like the data frame variable since we've been working with that. So you could say this G and DF as a string. Notice I had to quote DF. It's not a variable name, it's a string. And it's gonna look it up in that dictionary as a key string 
you can see even the variable G is in the globals itself. So we've got uh, the globals containing globals. But anyway, um, global just stands for global variables. And uh, there's also a locals, but they would be the same thing since we're in the global namespace here at the command line. Anyway, uh, G square bracket DF gives us the data frame. And if we want a particular row or column, we should put that here. And if we want a particular row, let's go to a different row this time. Let's see what uh, some of the other values are. Room three finish. So she's named her, she's put the, the number three as a word. She they could have typed that as the number three. Numbers are allowed within variable names. You just need to uh, start with a character. Um, uh, anyway, this will get me to that text for the room three finish. And it's, but you notice that I didn't have to use any variable names. And this can be handy if you've got a variable name as a string already somewhere. So if um, I could retrieve that, um, uh, like the function name, if this would work, oops, I need to put that in the first place rather than the second. Let's get rid of this one so it comes across the first. So this would give me all of the function names, but if I wanted a particular one, I could say I loc, and that would bring me up the row for the very first, Oh, right. That is the location that we're retrieving there. Look. And so that will give me the function name. Oh, no. Not look. Oh, that's right. I need to give it the, uh, the, the other piece of the puzzle. Room three finish. And I just need to say dot look on that. There we go. And that will give us the text. It will give us all the other columns as well, essentially as a dictionary where you could look up the text alone if you wanted to. But the idea here is that you could just work with strings and you don't, which is data driven. And you could have your entire application run by data without even having to call any function names, um, at least not any special function names for your particular application. You could have some function names that, um, that help you find the particular room that you need to be in, but the actual room names themselves could be um, could be in data rather than in code. Uh, if you have any questions, set up a meeting with me. I'd love to help you on your final project. Um, of course, my Calendly has been in previous announcements, but I'll give it here, calendly.com slash Hobbs, and um, set up an appointment and we'll talk about it and I'll try to help you out. Hope this has been helpful.